No, I'm not gonna sit here and say that the male characters of Genshin Impact are better written. That's obviously up for debate and probably not true, especially with the recent release of Fontaine. But there's always been an ongoing notion that the male characters in Genshin just have a lot more depth and better writing. They just somehow feel better written than the female cast. At least some of them do. And I'm here to discuss why that might be the case and the current state of male characters in Genshin Impact. As always, a couple of disclaimers. This video is my personal opinion and I will only talk about playable characters, mainly focusing on the 5 stars as I don't want the runtime of this video to be too crazy. To give context to more recent players, up until Sumeru or Patch 3.0, a lot of people, including myself, felt like the writing of the male characters was just better. They had better story quests, they have memorable events, and they just feel like well-rounded characters in comparison to the female characters. Now, I will try to focus only on the male characters and not make unfair comparisons to the female characters since a lot of the problems that the female characters have are also very applicable to the male ones, which is just a result of Hoyu's often questionable writing decisions. We also need to acknowledge that there's just a lot less male characters in the game. This allows them to feel a lot more distinct from one another, while while some of the female characters can feel like they're different versions of the same trope. Taking examples from pre-Sumeru, the 5-star male characters available at the time were Venti, the Luke, Child, Zhong Li, Albedo, Xiao, Kazuha, Ito, and lastly, Ayato. That's two Archons, one Yaksha, one Homunculus, and one Harbinger. Five out of the nine male characters are already intriguing by having a plot-relevant backstory and just a lot of lore in general. But hold up, Ganyu also has an interesting backstory and lore. She's an adeptus just like Xiao, so why do a lot of people feel like she's inferior in terms of writing? Is it her story quest? Her story quest actually has an interesting premise. Ganyu is unique as a character because she's half human, half adeptus, and thus she's never felt like she has belonged to the human world nor the world of the adepti. So then tell me why the hell did her story quest decide to take a turn and focus on an irrelevant tax evasion subplot? But I'm not gonna sit here and pretend Xiao's character story quest was much better. It was meh at best in my opinion. It focused way too much on Star Snatcher, an example of Genshin's infamous NPC story quest writing if you you will. Ganyu's story quest suffers from the exact same problem, just a bit worse because of how bad it was in terms of execution. The first half of Ganyu's story quest isn't really that bad, I was invested when she was going through her Adepti training. It's the second half that's really the problem because the quest turns into yet another let the traveler help this character with her work storyline. It had a nice idea behind it, unfortunately the execution of said idea was pretty bad. I would say the one redeeming quality of Xiao's quest is the inclusion of pervasives and the crumbs of Yaksha lore we managed to get through him, which is again the most defining trait of Xiao's character. Xiao also has a lot of appearances in the Lantern Rite events, we even get an emotional cutscene featuring Xiao, and later on we also got an interlude quest focusing on Xiao's development and Yaksha backstory. But we'll get to that. Albedo is also a good example of a character with very very unique and interesting lore that's highlighted really well even in the early days. His story quest sucked but his 1.2 Talkbrain event did a good job in teasing his backstory and relations to Conria. And then Hoyoverse fleshed out Albedo even more in the 2.3 event one year later. I think that's by far one of the most memorable and beloved events in Genshin's history outside of the annual summer events. Characters such as Venti and Zhongli follow a similar pattern, and they're both Archons, so they will have an interesting lore by default. Diluc was handled similarly, he has a big role in the Archon quest, and his story quest is a glimpse into his complicated double life as Mondstadt's Batman and Protector. So we have a lot of story quests and events focusing on the characters' already interesting lore. What's interesting is that they actually did the exact opposite with Child, sort of. Instead of focusing on what makes him interesting as a character, which is his lore, Child has interesting lore. He's the second Harbinger that we meet. He's from Shneshnaya. He's also the youngest out of all of the Harbingers. He's also the main villain and antagonist throughout the Liyue Archon Quest. Yet Hoyo decided to not focus on any of that. They basically developed his character by making the players understand his motives, hinting as to why he's choosing to work for the Saritza. And while Child is unhinged and has a lot of bloodlust, he also wants to protect his family. His family is just as important to 
him as serving the Tsaritsa and having a great time fighting. Focusing on this aspect of child was in my opinion a great decision because Hoyoverse was able to develop him without revealing too much of his lore because at that point which was patch 1.1 there was no way Hoyoverse could have revealed any information about him or the Harbingers. It was simply too early so they had other ways to make child an even more interesting and intriguing character. Moving on to Inazuma, the male characters felt like they were uh okay I guess? Definitely a lot of mixed opinions when it comes to Inazuma characters. Kazuha at one point felt like the protagonist of Inazuma which was weird. I mean I didn't hate it personally, I like Kazuha. He has the tragic backstory, he has a ton of great moments in the Archon quests. I think one of the most awesome cutscenes in the Inazuma Archon quest has him at the center of it. But most of his development and character growth happened off screen. The Archon quest only served as a resolution to his story similar to how Venti and Zhongli are fully developed characters. We do however get glimpses of Kazuha overcoming his struggles in an event. They're only glimpses though but it's still nice to see all of the tragic backstory and that backstory is actually what I hope to be his story quest but we'll get to his story quest later. Ito is personally a breath of fresh air after multiple male characters having a tragic backstory after tragic backstory and being emo as hell it's really really nice to have this beloved and kind-hearted himbo of a man and don't get me wrong he still comes with a sad backstory with being an oni and being ostracized by society but it's nice that despite all of that he manages to remain pure and unjaded is that a word i don't know but pure in a way that he retains this almost childlike innocence despite all of his hardships now you can interpret this as ito choosing to remain childish but i personally don't see it that way he's just one of those characters that wears his heart on his sleeve and honestly his english va's performance just makes him even more of a delight every time he appears on screen the last five star from inazuma is none other than the man the myth the legend himself ayato like seriously he was a myth at one point now this man i have a lot of issues with and that's because i think he is the walking definition of a missed potential male character edition he suffers a lot of issues that kokomi suffered from as well he sold as the scheming and brilliant politician the same way kokomi was a brilliant strategist but we just never got to see much of it we do get moments of his scheming usually it's with yai miko but it just ends up with ayoto feeling like everything is going to keikaku trope he also shows up very late into the inazuma patch you would think that being the commissioner of the yashiro commission he would have a bigger role or at least a cameo in the archon quest yes i get that he has to work from the shadows but the same problem with kokomi it's never really shown and just because he pulls all of the strings doesn't mean that he's exempt from the telling but not showing problem that kenshin has this is most evident with his story quest now ayato probably has the most disliked story quest in the game especially for a male character some people find it really boring especially if you're not a fan of political drama because it's mainly that plus with the addition of everything that an NPC story quest has to offer. It's about an NPC that we don't really care about. We don't get to see much of Ayato except at the beginning and at the end. And the story quest itself doesn't add to Ayato, which is a problem because he's already a character that we don't know much about. We already know that he works from the shadows from all of the voice lines about him and all of his promotional materials and descriptions. His story quest was such a missed opportunity to show more about him as a leader of the Yashiro Commission, the Shu Matsuban, and as an older brother to one of the most important characters in Inazuma. While it might be enjoyable for people who enjoy historical or political dramas, it didn't develop Ayato as much as they could have and honestly it would have just been more interesting if Ayato was just more present in his own quest. This man has a lot of rewritten lore to offer. He also has interesting dynamics with Yai Miko, another sly character in the story and while they have their fun moments in events it's again usually just them giggling at the end of an event and surprising everyone that they are yet again behind most of the shenanigans that goes on in Inazuma. Kazuha's story quest is probably another story quest that Hoyo managed to fumble somehow. Now I don't dislike it as much as I disliked Ayato's story quest. I feel like it has a few more things to offer that being the parallels between Kagotsurube Ishin and the Wanderer. Now this isn't explicitly stated so I'm gonna put on my theorist hat for this one but it's theorized that Kagotsurube Ishin's journey of bloodlust and revenge from Shrishnaya and making it all the way back to its homeland, Inazuma, is 
a parallel to the Wanderer's story, which I think is pretty damn cool with how the Wanderer is single-handedly responsible for the fall of the Kaedehara clan and various other members of the Raiden Gokaden. Now for the last story quest that I think is more on the weaker side for the male characters is without a doubt Albedo. It's honestly one of the most forgettable story quests in the game, period. It doesn't have any NPCs yet somehow the quest doesn't tell you anything about him as a character other than the fact that he's an alchemist, which we already know. It has the most boring execution out of all the story quests in the game, including the female characters as well, like even Ganyu's story quest was far more interesting than Albedo's story quest. I personally always thought that the patch 1.2 talk prince event was his story quest. It did so much for him as a character than his own story quest ever did. And yet that event is the one that most players will never experience because again that was way back in 1.2, literally at the end of 2020. Aside from a few rough ones which were the ones we just discussed, even in the early days of Genshin, most of the male characters story quests have always been held as the better written story quests. Which is why I guess a lot of people just feel like the male characters are more well rounded or just have a lot more layers to them. Venti Zhongli and Child Story Quest is, I think, the top 3 story quests that's held in high regard in the earlier days of Genshin. Venti's story quest probably caught a lot of people off guard with how emotional it was, especially for a character that up until that point has always been portrayed as this whimsical jokester of a man. And up until that point, we only know that he's an Archon and that he fought for the freedom of Mondstadt alongside his people. Never really anything too personal, but his story quest changed that. His story quest is about Hans, who was stricken with grief after the death of his friend, Stanley. After Stanley's death, Hans decided to take his identity and live as his friend. In the quest, we see Venti be one of the more gentler gods of Teyvat as he gave Hans closure by reuniting him with Stanley's spirit. Now we know that Venti is kind and benevolent, but we didn't know how personal Stanley's story was to him. Hans and Stanley's story is a direct parallel to Venti's own story with his friend, the Nameless Bard, that died fighting for Mondstadt's freedom. Venti, then only a wind spirit decided to take his friend's human form so that he will always be remembered. The same way that he decided to become a bard himself, so that his people's experiences and his own memory can be carried out through generations through ballads and songs. Now yes, it's tragic and people love tragic stories, but the thing that struck me personally about Venti's quest wasn't because of how sad his story was, but because it showed the juxtaposition of his past and his current self. The story quest helped in adding layers to Venti as a character. Zhongli's second story quest is also often regarded as one of the best story quests in Genshin's early days. I thought it was good, I mean it's one of the most lore heavy story quests so that in itself is already a recipe for a good quest, similar to how a second story quest was really good. You get to learn more about this very mysterious deity, we get to see glimpses of their past. In this case, it's in the form of Ejdaha, Zhongli's former friend, a bishop who has succumbed to erosion. I think the concept of erosion was introduced in this quest, erosion in Genshin lore is how the oldest and most powerful beings in Teyvat are basically a ticking time bomb. They will forget who they are and in the worst case scenario become a danger to humanity, just like Ejdaha did. This very concept that's so detrimental to the fate of Archons and other immortal deities was established in Zhongli's second story quest. Plus we got an emotional quest about yet another friend that Zhongli has lost to time. It adds yet another layer of this somber tone to his character. He's the oldest of all Archons and someone who understands grief more than anyone else in the game because of how much he had to endure over the years. Which is why seeing Zhongli parting ways with his beloved friend, someone from his past, is always emotional. And all of that combined made a very memorable story quest for the players to enjoy. The last story quest from the early days that's held in very high regard is obviously Tartalia's. Now people who love Tartalia probably have nothing bad to say about his story quest, while those who are indifferent to him or hate him might consider his story quest to be boring because we spend 80% of the time with his brother, Tuser, instead of, well, child himself. Now, I personally like Tartalia's story quest. On paper, his story quest should suck. It spends 80% of the time with an NPC. It's not really about him. Nothing really happens. There's no game-changing lore. Heck, there isn't any lore. And yet, it's regarded as one of the best story quests in the game, especially in the early days. And it's all because Hoyoverse used the central NPC of the story 
story, that being too sir, to add to child as a character instead of shifting away the focus from the playable 5 star. We already know from the Archon quest that Tartalia is unhinged. He's a harbinger and he's not the most morally upstanding person you'll meet in the game. The story quest gives room for Hoyoverse to show a side of Tartalia that we wouldn't get to see otherwise. Inserting child's backstory about how much he loves his family wouldn't have worked in the Archon quest because one, it would've just been weird to do that when we're trying to solve the mystery behind Rex Lapis's death and somehow got roped into babysitting some guy's baby brother. Two, with the addition of Tuser, regardless of how annoying he can be, he is a plot device that helps to add layers to child as a character. The NPC actually serves a purpose. If there were no Tuser, there wouldn't be any plausible way for the players to see child in his role as an older brother. A role that humanizes him, a character who otherwise is just another villain filled with extreme bloodlust. The addition of Tuser humanizes child to the traveler as well. They even have a moment where they connect over their desire to protect their siblings. In comparison, if we take out Star Snatcher from Xiao's story quest, it would have made the quest shorter but the impact that the story quest has on Xiao as a character still would have been the same. Ito's story quest is also one that actually surprised me. Ito is not a character with a complicated personality. What you see is literally what you get. He wears his heart on his sleeve, yet his story quest seemingly was able to place Ito and all of his simplicity in the middle of very nuanced topics such as tolerance, acceptance, and complicated character dynamics. I think the one part of his quest that I didn't like was how they forced me to throw beans to trigger his allergies. Yes, this is a nitpick, but as someone with severe allergies, I would rather someone punch me than have them trigger my allergies the same way the traveler did to Ito. But all in all, yeah, it's a good story quest. It's an enjoyable quest that does its job by adding layers to the featured character and it expands a bit on Ito's pre-written lore. Which is all you could ask for in a story quest, really? Now with that out of the way, let's talk about the male characters in Sumeru. For the female characters, Sumeru was a big turning point. We got fantastic characters such as Tihya and Kale. So what about the male characters? Well, in terms of story quests, I would say there weren't a lot that stood out to me. I'm not saying they're all bad, there just weren't any exceptional ones for the male characters. Now before you come at me, Tikneri is probably the sole exception to that because of how well they handled the quest slot. The story quest itself wasn't about him, which is usually a detriment to a character's story quest because if done wrong, they will literally bore you to hell and back. So why does Tignari's quest work while Ayato and Kazuha's didn't? Tignari's quest didn't reveal anything new about him, we know the same things we did before we started the quest. We learn essentially nothing new about him, there's no expansion to his lore or backstory. He's a part of this very unique race of fox people but that wasn't even mentioned in his quest. And why am I emotionally invested in this robot yet I can't seem to care less about all of the other NPCs that's featured in character story quests? Is it because Tignari's story quest is sad? You could say the same thing about Meng in Hu Tao's story quest but I'm not emotionally attached to Meng the same way I'm attached to this thing. And then it occurred to me, Karkata softens Tignari's personality. And seeing that kindness is definitely what makes his story quest special because it's not just to some random person, he extends that compassion onto a mechanical object. Yes, it's sentient, but the fact that Karkata is sentient is what makes it dangerous. Which is probably why the academia banned research into shit like this because they're potentially a danger to society. And yet, Tignari broke the rules in order to let Karkata live. And they did a good job in showing how Karkata being such a good boy with a cutscene that really just tugs on your heartstrings. It's definitely in the execution. Hoyo really nailed the execution on this one, which is why a lot of players got so attached relatively quickly. I personally think that's why it worked for me. Like, I couldn't get behind a lot of NPC story quests, but this one was able to build on Tignari's character by emphasizing his kindness and compassion. The same way Avin did in Yoimiya's second story quest. The other two Sumeru story quests were eh, in my opinion. Like, they're enjoyable, don't get me wrong, but I guess it's the same issue that I have with Kazuha's and Ayato's story quests. I know using the day focus too much on NPCs argument is like beating a dead horse at this point, but that's really the main problem that I have with most of these story quests. I guess for Sino though, it's a bit different. I didn't hate this story quest, nor the NPC. I actually still found the whole exploration on how being a matra is a thankless job 
job and the NPCs involved to be fairly interesting. So I'm not gonna say that Sino Story Quest is bad. It's pretty okay. It bothers me because there are more interesting things about Sino that could have been addressed in his story quest. And it's not like it's completely hidden behind a wall of text. They teased it in the Archon Quest in that very same patch. He has an entire backstory that we still don't know to this day and I guess they're saving the Temple of Silence for another day. Maybe if we had the opportunity to get a sense of who Sino is as a character besides his job and his relationship with Dignari and Kole and uh, his jokes, I would be more invested in the exploration of his role as the General Bahamatra. I'm guessing that part of his lore is tied to something bigger, like I don't know if that's Scopium or not or that it's going to be a massive floor bomb later on, but yeah, his quest isn't the best, it's not incredibly boring like Albedo's, but it's not as emotionally charged as Dignari's as well, so yeah, it's pretty okay but not really impactful. If I were to make comparisons in terms of execution, it reminds me of Fu Tao's story quest, like how her quest highlights how important her role is as the Wangsheng funeral parlor director, but also at the same time, I feel like it would've just been a lot more interesting if the focus was on the characters and not the NPCs, given just how much lore they actually have. For Al Haytham, it's about a mad scholar and it was actually fine. It's not the most memorable because Al Haytham got a lot of his character moments in the Archon quest itself. There wasn't really anything for his story quest to highlight. However, Al Haytham is an interesting character but he's not one with interesting lore or backstory, which is kind of funny and fascinating. Outside of his prestigious job as the scribe, he's actually kind of normal. He has a 9 of 5, he has a house, and is really just trying to do his job most of the time. He's a scholar through and through, greatly values the pursuit of knowledge, and will get annoyed at meaningless distractions. And he's ultra pragmatic and super calculating and apparently a great actor, all of which were already shown in the Archon Quest. So his story quest not being able to outshine all of his moments in the Archon Quest or reveal anything new about him is actually pretty expected. Okay, before we move on to Fontaine, let's talk about Baiju. Baiju's story quest is interesting. I actually like it a lot more than I thought I would. It also features Su Tao, which presents a very interesting character dynamic because as some of you might already know, they're basically opposites of each other. Baiju is someone who is actively trying to achieve immortality. That's why he does the things that he does and why he keeps Chi Chi around. Well, Hu Tao is the funeral parlor director. She believes that everyone should cross over to the other side when their time runs out, as that is the natural order of things. Hu Tao respects the cycle of life and death, while Baiju is actively trying to find loopholes. They are the antithesis of each other, and seeing them interact in his story quest was very entertaining to me. It allows the player base to understand where Baiju stands and his motivations and goals, which in turn adds layers to him as a character. Okay, moving on to Fontaine. Now, Fontaine is just overall a step up in Genshin's writing, both for female and male characters. Duvillette is obviously one of the best written characters in the game. Like his story quest is about the damn Melusine, but it works, and I'll talk about it more in a bit. Lenny is also a solid character in my opinion. He does his job really well as the introductory character in Fontaine. He lives up to his potential as this playful cheeky magician, and while I thought it was a bit fast for the traveler to care enough about Lenny to defend him in a murder trial, it's pretty okay. Like, it's still believable, and I'm not gonna nitpick that much. I like how Hoyu executed the reveal of his true identity as a member of the House of the Hearth. I mean, most of the players probably could have sensed that there was something shady with the twins, but to the traveler, it does genuinely feel like they were blindsided. And I have said before that I actually like how upset the traveler was at Linny. Was he harsh? Yes. Do I want to treat Linny like the traveler did? No, absolutely not. But it's understandable given the traveler's history with the Fatui and why they were so distrusting of anything related to the organization. And Linny did purposely omit that he's part of the Fatui and his connections with the knave. He never mentioned any of that. So I personally think that the anger was justified given the full context of the situation. And with all of that in mind, I think it makes the placement of Linny's story quest a bit strange, especially if you play his story quest in 4.0, which is the patch that it was released. I found it a bit strange because of how friendly the traveler was with the twins. Like given everything, they were a bit too trusting of them. I think his quest would have made more sense had it took place at the end of the Fontaine Archon quest, which is again just more of a structural problem with how Hoyo forces the story quest to be released alongside of the character. Narrative wise, it doesn't make sense, but marketing wise, it does. But nevertheless, I think Linny's story quest was pretty good. I don't think it's the best that Fontaine has to offer, but it's definitely on par with the other quests that were released. It has a mystery to grip you as soon as it starts, and it definitely has a lot of emotional moments 
moments with the central NPC, Caesar, who is also directly linked to Linny and Lynette's childhood. It also has a fun twist at the end with the reveal of who the real Phantom Weasel was. So to summarize the quest, after Linny and Lynette were taken in by the knave early in their childhood, they approached Caesar so they could learn to become magicians themselves. And Caesar saw the potential in the twins, hence why he took them in as apprentices. During their time with Caesar, Linny and Lynette were treated well even though they've never been fully honest with Caesar about who they are and why they approached him in the first place. Caesar's kindness towards the twins is the thing that kicks off the plot of the story quest. The twins wanted to clear his name after he was falsely accused of being the phantom weasel even long after his death. The mystery and quest itself was easy to follow. We also learned that Caesar was actually killed by one of his own assistants, Lorenzo, who sabotaged his magic trick by tampering with the box that was used in a very dangerous act. And then they added another twist by revealing that the phantom weasel mentioned earlier was in fact his own fiance. Gemma. She also partook in sabotaging Caesar's magic act that ultimately killed him. In fact, she used Lorenzo so that she didn't have to get her own hands dirty. Now, I don't know how the twins figured out the link between Lorenzo and Gemma and also her being the phantom weasel right from the start, but they did somehow. Now, while the quest itself didn't reveal a ton about Lini and Lynette's lore or go in depth about their ties with the Fatui, it does highlight a very important trait that both Lini and Lynette have. They always tend to omit the truth from the Traveler. Even if they claim that they are friends with the Traveler and that they have enough trust in them, they have a tendency to hide the full truth unless they're absolutely sure that it would benefit them. This isn't a trait that surprises anyone because they were taught to only trust in each other, in their family, in the house of the heart. This behavior adds a layer of moral complexity to the twins because you know that they aren't inherently bad people but they also aren't necessarily the most trustworthy people either. All in all, solid quest. Next up is Risley. Risley, boy oh boy, I have a bone to pick with this one. I like his character. I like that he turned out to be more than what I expected. Honestly, at first glance, I thought his character would be more of an edgelord type just based on his design, but he's actually pretty chill. Now, I didn't really enjoy his quest. I didn't like that I had to run around the fortress of Meropeed again after just doing that shit for three hours in the Archon quest, only to have his entire backstory dumped on me at the last minute. I did not enjoy that. Yes, I liked that they at least showed Risley's dark past and how he ended up in the fortress of Meerbeet in the first place, but Hoyo really could have executed the entire thing better. I know the whole point of the Beret Society and the villain is to show just how much Risley has grown as a person. He chose to show mercy instead of executing the main perpetrator, which is something that he has done early in his childhood. But again, I think it would have been better had we understood Risley's motivations from the beginning instead of it being the big surprise at the end. I think Risley's story quest highlights one big problem that Kenshin has with the way it writes and structures its stories and it's to have a very slow build up in hopes that we get a good payoff at the last 10 minutes of the quest which doesn't make a good experience for me personally I don't like going into story quest already expecting to be bored for at least the first hour and hope that it will actually have a good cutscene or moment at the end it would actually be nice to have a story quest to grip you into an interesting plotline and then have this incredibly moving and emotional payoff at the end. And they have done this several times. There's Ventis, Childs, a second story quest, Dihyas, and of course, Nouvellettes. Nouvellettes story quest is about the Melusines, and it still managed to grab me by the throat almost as soon as it started. As soon as it starts, it immediately tells you that Nouvellette, the Udex of Fontaine, is curiously adamant about taking on a case himself, which Sadine points out as strange. This doesn't seem like a case that the Udex should be involved in, at least not so directly. And this particular case just so happens to center around a melazine. Nouvellet then says that this case reminds him of the time that he just became the Udex centuries ago, and how he, as the new chief justice, initiated a series of institutional reforms. It wastes no time in setting up the quest. He even mentions the two central NPCs in the next sentence. This structure works because one, 
I went into the quest knowing that it's going to be about Nuvlet's past. Two, whatever the case was, it caused massive changes to Fontaine because, well, Nuvlet said so. Three, I knew that the NPCs involved were especially close to Nuvlet and how they were the only two people that he could trust early on. Also, how he wasn't able to protect them, with one literally unaliving herself and the other being exiled. And then he just casually explains that Melazines used to be discriminated against. With just this bit of information being presented at the beginning of the quest was enough to set up context on why the events that's about to transpire are important to Nuvlet, which is something that I wish Risley's quest had done also. All of that setup was enough to intrigue me and made me want to know more about the story. And then we learned that Kiara, also Melazine, has received a threatening letter, which is why Nuvlet is so concerned. He's concerned that history is repeating itself. It also has similar story beats as Dignari's story quest. I mean, it's not exactly the same, but it's framed in a similar way. Nuvlet is a very low relevant character, aside from the Archons in Genshin, yet his story quest didn't include any significant lore bombs that a lot of players expected. Instead, it uses two very prominent NPCs to soften Nuvlet as a character. The focus of the story was to show how Nuvlet has a very tender heart and how despite being the Hydro Sovereign, he has a lot of humanity and empathy in his heart. They've already shown how Nuvlet is kind-hearted and feels a lot of human emotions in the Archon quest with the way he weeped for Navia's pain during their meeting. And in his story quest, they doubled down on this again while also showing why he is the way he is. And we don't get a definitive answer why Nuvlet is so empathetic because Nuvlet himself doesn't know why he feels so deeply for other people. He doesn't know why he's reborn as a human and why he lost his memories and all that. So he thinks that if he'd spent enough time going through what must be thousands of trials and observing humans as closely as he could, he would understand his purpose and the meaning behind his existence better. When Nuvilet first became the chief justice, he made a lot of reforms which includes the integration of Melazines, a then unknown race, into Fontaine society. And it pissed a lot of people off. So long story short, people who are opposed to Nuvilet used Carol as a scapegoat and it resulted in the loss of her life. Carol was a Melazine who was full of hope. She was brought to Fontaine by Nuvilet because Melazines have unique abilities that could be useful for investigative work such as being able to spot literal bloodstains. Carol was more than happy to be in Fontaine. She felt that this new job given by Nouvellet gave her life meaning. Yes, it's safer for her to stay in the village but she wanted to do more. She wanted to understand the purpose of her own existence. She wanted Melazines and humans to live peacefully alongside one another, which at the time was seen as a far-off dream, at least Vautran thought so. And at the time, considering how people literally threw rocks at her, things weren't looking great for Carol. Vautran, the other person Nuvlet mentioned at the start of the quest, was also very close to Carol. She reminded him of his own late sister that passed away at a young age. Obviously enraged by Carol's death, he became consumed with revenge. Nuvlet then sentenced Vautran to the Fortress of Meripede as he felt he needed to enact justice despite understanding the complexity behind his motives. Regardless of Nuvlet's own feelings, he decided that he needed to follow the law. Vautran still abused his authority and was still, at the end of the day, a killer. Later on in the quest, Nuvillette soon comes to the realization that the people of Fontaine have changed. They no longer view the Melazines as an outsider. They have also grown to trust Nuvillette's judgment. And through his role as Chief Justice, he has also proven himself to the people of Fontaine. And in turn, the people of Fontaine have also come to trust his judgment. No one is rallying against the Melazines instead it's quite the opposite. The people of Fontaine were enraged once they found out that someone is out to harm a Melazine. And this realization and change is such a big character moment for Nouvellet. He comes to an understanding that humans are capable of change. It took 400 years but something that seemed so impossible and was considered an absurd dream is now a reality. Humans are capable of growth and acceptance. They've accepted Melazines as a part of Fontaine the same way they have accepted him as their Udex and Chief Justice. As Risley points out, he's no longer an outsider. He has proven himself in the 400 years that he has served as Chief Justice. Even in Vautran's own trial, people expected him to go out on a limb and bail his friend out. But instead, Nuvlet was able to distance himself from the situation and sent his own trusted companion into the fortress of Mirapit. And through countless trials, Nuvlet became the symbol of the law in Fontaine. A good four or five months after playing 
doing the quest and I'm still pretty confident in saying that this is probably the best story quest that Genshin currently has to offer. It managed to make me feel angry, sad, and happy in the span of what, like an hour? The execution of Nuvlet's story quest was incredible. The contrast between how the humans interacted with Carol 400 years ago and the way the people wanted to protect Melusine's now just tugged my heartstrings. It showed just how far Fontaine has come and also just how much Nuvlet has changed. All of the trials that he took part in left an impression on him. He may not realize it himself but in time Nuvlet becomes closer and closer and holds a much deeper understanding of humans. Now I don't know what it is but the male characters in Genshin tend to have a lot of great moments in events. Either they get full character introductions, lore exploration, and just fun interactions overall which just doesn't happen for a lot of the female 5 stars and 4 stars at least up until this point. When discussing events, a few male characters come to mind for me. The first being the Wanderer. Mostly because he was initially introduced in an event, that being the first ever story major event way back in 1.1, the Unreconciled Stars event. I already have a 1 hour video on the Wanderer if you're interested, but I will say Hoyo's introduction of him in Unreconciled Stars is much more interesting than what you would have gotten in Inazuma, which unfortunately is what most newer players will experience with how early Unreconciled Stars was. In Unreconciled Stars, you get to see him as this two-faced backstabbing b that tries to kill you after being fake for a good half of the event, which is what made his initial introduction really fun in my opinion. But his introduction in Inazuma, we just get him being, well, a b it's still fun, but it's not really the same. Another character that's mostly memorable in events is obviously Albedo. If not for the Dragon Spine events, Albedo would have, have probably been forgotten by most of the player base. Because let's face it, even though he is one of the most lore relevant characters in the game, that being he's literally the creation of gold, the alchemist, and person responsible for the downfall of Conria, as mentioned earlier, he also has one of the most boring story quests imaginable. It does nothing for his character and most most of the development that he has is through the Chalk Prince event which introduced the players to other creations of gold, that being Durin, and in turn reveals a lot about Albedo as a homunculus. And then we also have the second Dragon Spine event, Shadows Admit Snowstorms, which I think still remains as one of the most memorable events in Genshin for just how good it is. That event has an interesting cast which makes for fun character interactions and character dynamics. It has a ton of lore bombs and it was the birthplace of many fun theories. Like you could not escape the did Sasbedo replace Albedo at the end theories back in December 2021. Which thinking about it now, I think the open ending of that event was the only thing that I didn't really like. I wasn't really a fan of how they just made it seem that his evil twin was still running around only to not have a follow up to that event. Even if they did have a follow up on it now, it would have made no sense for newer players. Which is again, is the issue with time limited events. Another example of an interesting plotline that was just dropped completely after an event is the child is in Inazuma to hunt down the balladeer plotline. Like what happened to that? He mentioned that he was looking for the balladeer and then I guess he just gave up and went shopping for souvenirs. Other than that, I think most of the character centric events were pretty fun and I still think the events do a lot more for the male characters than it does for the female characters. Like even in the events where it's not as lore heavy or serious, we get so much of Ito. I know it's because Ito is just a character that can easily fit into any event. He's so wacky that you don't really think much of him appearing in random places. Kinda like Klee if you're looking for comparisons. I've honestly lost count of how many events Ito has been in but for the most part they're usually lighthearted and just there for a good time. No lore bombs, no big emotional moments and I've always felt like it works because Ito was allowed to have his character defining moment in his own story quest. Now I can't talk about events without talking about the annual land Lantern Rite. The Lantern Rite focuses on different characters or sometimes a group of characters each year. The first year it was Xiao, second it was Keqing, and the third it was on a lot of characters but most of the story focus were on two very important NPCs that being Madame Bing and Gui Zhong. The fourth and latest Lantern Rite focused on Xiang Yun as the featured 5 star and we also spent a lot of time with Ga Ming. This comment that I got on my last video stood out to me because it really did feel like Hoyo just took Inaya's 
story which if you don't remember who that is she was the npc from nilu's story quest and upgraded it they took her story added interesting and fun character moments and made the entire thing about an actual playable character that we care about and what do you know it was a very enjoyable event quest not only did it establish gaming as a relatable character with all of his daddy issues it allows him to feel like a person that lives in liyue and has real problems and not just the newest character that's gonna be added to the roster which in a gacha game is basically the bare minimum that you could ask for now the first lantern ride really did a lot for xiao most of the interesting character interactions that we had with him was during the lantern ride and other liyue centric events like for example the moon chase festival as we have established his story quest didn't really do anything for him the plot of the first lantern ride was basically let's see if we can drag xiao to the harbor and enjoy lantern ride and for him to have one night off to just enjoy life and feel all of the appreciation that the people of liyue have for him because you know being a yaksha is basically to live a secluded life full of nothing but pain and suffering until you inevitably succumb to darkness and die which is actually a good storyline outside of that xiao got a lot of character development in an interlude quest that was also the flagship event of patch 2.7 which dealt with the yakshas and ghosts of his past after the interlude quest xiao is much more receptive with social interactions and while he has occasionally shown up for the traveler he's not really one to interact with anyone else but now he lets himself get dragged to a lantern ride dinner by hu tao and even considers beating her when he sees her kite in the latest lantern ride he really has softened a lot with each event and each lantern ride and it's sad that not a lot of players especially the ones who love xiao can witness it firsthand probably except for the interlude quest because again most of it takes place in a limited time event which begs the question should events have less character and plot relevance i don't think so i'm not gonna lie to you guys all right it's really hard for me to be interested in an event unless it heavily revolves around a character and their story or lore so hoyo has two options here keep doing what they're doing and potentially ruining character experiences for a lot of the newer players or do what honkai star rail has done and just make the flagship event story available for people who want to experience them i hate making comparisons and yes storage is probably the biggest issue that's hindering them from making these changes but until then a lot of characters will feel different to a lot of players especially newer players why is this important if someone likes a character's design they'll pull for them regardless of their lore backstory and writing so who cares right well i'm sure that statement can be applied for some of the player base like to an extent i can apply that statement to myself i myself have pulled for characters purely because i find their design appealing but 90 percent of the time i find myself pulling for characters that i find appealing in terms of story or personality now i actually have this story about how i skipped albedo's first banner because i'm not gonna lie to you his design isn't particularly interesting to me initially so i skipped him because i was saving for xiao at the time and then the more i got into genshin's lore and character backstory that mother <laughs> grew on me and i begged hoyo for his rerun almost every day i quite literally could not stop screaming to my friends about how much i regret not pulling on his release banner this also happened to me for Tignari. like design wise i didn't find his design the most appealing plus he was gonna be in the standard banner anyway so i figured i'd get him eventually did he grow on me yes with each <laughs> our conquest and events Tignari grew on me as a character did i eventually get him yeah only a full year later after his release which also almost drove me insane while we're here i would like to tackle the question do the male characters actually have more distinct personalities or are, are they well for lack of a better word still cardboard boxes i personally lean towards that i do think they actually have more distinct personalities or at least hoyo does a better job at showcasing their different personalities to the players obviously some of them have interesting lore and personalities that are fully explored in the main quests like the wanderer i think he's the best example of a character that has had development not only from the main quest but also a limited time events it also helps that hoyo allowed him to be evil and even in his redemption storyline if you want to call it that he's still allowed to be an asshole to the traveler which makes him feel very distinct and unique and dare i say refreshing when compared to all of the other characters in the game he's definitely 
definitely not everyone's cup of tea, but he's definitely different. And people, especially OG Scaramouche fans, lost their marbles when they thought he was gonna get a personality reset. I don't think we've had a female playable character that's as evil as Scaramouche was. I mean, we all thought it was gonna be Senora, but I guess we'll have to wait until the knave is released. I'm also anticipating if they will make Notori playable, he is without question the most irredeemable character in the game. Like, not even a tragic backstory will save his ass in the traveler's eyes kind of evil. But still, I personally want him to be playable because I like villain characters. We also have characters that have interesting lore, an intriguing personality, yet the execution in showcasing that character has been pretty bad. Case and point, Ayato. He has the potential to become a very morally gray character like he's implied to be, yet they don't really show it. And yet we also have characters like Alhatham who's supposed to be this normal guy just trying to do his job as the academia scribe, yet somehow man got the development and spotlight to shine as the group's genius strategist in the main quest. It was a really nice way of showing that Alhatham, who's actually supposed to be this very stoic and almost robotic man, has a lot of layers. It's also really good that Hoyo made his motives quite clear, he just wants to do his job and live a good life. He has no interest in gaining power or moving up the ranks, man is really out here just trying to do his 9 to 5. Now, the fan service characters. I criticized Ayaka as a character with excessive pandering to the traveler, and the male version of that is definitely Xiao. I mean, it's a fun fan service for the ones who like it, but I personally think it's unnecessary. And yeah, I do think it's kinda unfair that Ayaka gets a lot of the flack for being the traveler simp while Xiao is basically unscathed because of his tragic backstory. Ayaka has a tragic backstory too, so what gives? And no, it's not because Genshin players hate women, it's again because Xiao was given so much time for moments outside of the traveler pandering. A lot of his lore is shown in multiple events and even in an entire interlude quest surrounding the chasm. So it's easier for a lot of people to ignore his more fan service moments because he's able to offer a lot in terms of lore as a character. Ayaka can too, but in my personal opinion, Hoyo just didn't utilize her lore and backstory as much as they could have. I personally don't enjoy any fan service moments, like I don't think it ruins the game or anything, but I do find it unnecessary and it sometimes takes me out of the story. That's really the main reason why I don't like them. Linny is probably what you would call a fan service character too, like he actually actively flirts with the traveler in his voice lines. And yes, that's also a form of fan service, the same way the female characters having voice lines that has romantic undertones in them. But why don't players give the same amount of flack to Linny the same way they do to Xiao or Ayaka? I think it just comes down to how believable it is. You can absolutely believe that Linny can say these flirtatious lines to the traveler even when they basically just met because we know he's charismatic. It's believable that he will flirt with strangers, not just a traveler, to get his way or well just because he can. He's a showman, he has that riz, I think is what young people call it these days. Well, Xiao and Ayaka, at least in my opinion, it feels like pandering. Well, yes, it can work because you can argue that they've developed a friendship over the course of the game through the Archon quest, the story quest, and events, but, but again, in my opinion, the connection or bond that's established with a traveler isn't really enough to warrant these types of interactions from characters like Xiao or Ayaka who are extremely reserved to feel organic. What's interesting to me is that the male four stars never really got the spotlight the same way the female four stars have. Like we never got a big scene or story plot involving a male four star, especially in the early days. I would say this changed with Toma because he was the first person that we met in Inazuma. He introduced the traveler to Ayaka. He was the one the traveler saved during the vision hunt decree. But that's really it. The next male four star to have a pretty big spotlight on them is Kave, and that's in an event. This is obviously not the case now because we just got an entire lantern ride focusing so much on Gaming and his complicated relationship with his father. Now, I am only bringing this up because it's a shame that a lot of the earlier four stars never really got a chance to shine because some of them have really interesting backstories. Like, I was wrong, okay? I guess people do want a five hour quest about Bennett's backstory because, my god, a Apparently, there's some deep lore and theory in his backstory and how he was born that we really don't have the time to get into, but I'll link to some interesting theories below if you're interested. And also, I completely forgot that we even have a Razor story quest teasing about how he was raised by wolves, but Hoyo never really explored any of it again. Tong Yoon and Sing Cho never really got the spotlight as well, like Sing Cho has been featured in several events because he is a writer, but it never really delved deep into his lore or anything else about his character. The hangouts that feature Toma 
Ma and Chong Yoon aren't also particularly groundbreaking. Like, you'll enjoy them if you like these characters, but I still didn't really learn much. You know, I've always wondered what happened to Toma's parents. Like, he went from Mondstadt to Inazuma to find his dad, so he left his mom back in Mondstadt, and then he also never found his dad in Inazuma, yet he just chose to stay and work for the Kamisato family because of reasons, I guess. I think Ayato helped him at one point. Don't quote me on that, I might be wrong. Like, why didn't he go back to Mondstadt? What happened to his dad? What happened to his mom in Mondstadt? I'm guessing she's okay with her son never coming back from his trip to Inazuma. Does he write to his mother? So many questions and seemingly no answers. Or maybe I just missed them? Please let me know if I've somehow missed this much of Toma's lore. I just find it hilarious. Like, they could've addressed this in his hangout, but I guess hangouts are more for the fun service interactions. But since he's a 4-star, there's no hope for a story quest, so I guess maybe it will be addressed in an event sometime in the future. Same with Bennett's backstory and all of the other 4-stars that we haven't seen before. And Kaya, like, he is probably one of the most lore-relevant male characters that we have right now, considering that he's literally a descendant of Conria. And I love that we've gotten some interactions between him and Dinesleeve, and I genuinely cannot wait for more. I get that we can't get the full extent of Kaya's lore until quite literally the end of the game, probably because of obvious reasons, but it's also definitely something that I look forward to seeing in the future. So yeah, that's pretty much all I have to say for the male characters in Genshin. I still think they suffer a lot of similar problems as the female characters. Basically, Hoyo just needs to have a more balanced execution for the story quest, so it focuses on the featured character and also have these goddamn lore-heavy events be playable for everyone. I don't know how, but I hope Hoyo, a multi-million dollar company, can figure that shit out. Thanks for sticking around this long. Let me know if you want me to talk about something specific. It doesn't have to be Genshin specific if I'm interested in it. And if I have something to say, I'll probably talk about it. We're here to have fun after all. But yeah, anyway, I'll stop yapping now and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!